Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. In the name of the Portuguese Institute of Industrial Property, IMP, let me welcome our audience and speakers from all over the world to the webinar entitled The Future of Planet Earth as the Industrial Property of All of Us. The major goal of this webinar is to provide a debate on the importance of protecting innovative solutions in the area of green technologies as a means to pro of promoting the development and economic growth of modern societies. To open this webinar, I have the pleasure to give the floor to Mrs. Anna Bandeira, the president of MP. Anna, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear honorable ministers, dear speakers, dear colleagues, dear distinguished guests. Allow me first and foremost to thank my team responsible for the organization of this event. It's an honor for me to open this webinar entitled The Future of the Planet Has Industrial Property for All of Us. This is a side event of the high level conference on e-justice which is occurring today and tomorrow. I would like to start by thanking all of you for joining us to celebrate innovation and creativity at this very important global milestone, World Intellectual Property Day. As in previous years, we are celebrating World WIPO Day with the purpose of raising awareness for the fundamental role that IPRs play in stimulating innovation and creativity. In spite of these efforts undertaken by member states by means of public policies that discourage the consumption of fossil fuels, these still remain the main promoters of energy, thus generating well-known side effects such as global warming. It's important to understand how the existing and necessary companionship between intellectual property and innovation benefits global society. We should take from the knowledge a lesson that enables the construction of a better future for generations to come, always scrutinizing science outcomes. As a way to reflect on these extremely important issues and celebrate Intellectual Property Day, the Portuguese office is honored to create this discussion forum. This initiative is in line with one of the five priorities of the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union, which is Green Europe, Green Europe promoting the EU as a leader in climate action. Our objective is to reflect on the role of technological innovation and industrial property as the key to a sustainable future. The agenda will start with an explanation of WIPO Green project, which welcomes the adhesion of Portugal. This was created to encourage innovation and dissemination of green technologies, putting in contact the suppliers of technology with those who are searching for them in order to obtain better business transactions. In the second panel, entitled Innovation in Batteries and Electricity Storage, we will set off together on a journey towards a more sustainable future and see how green patents are essential for building this future. DPO will explain how a green transition is possible for innovation in the field of energy. The excessive consumption of fuels is the main consequence of the warming of the planet through the release of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Until the 1990s, the global air temperature remained relatively stable. However, we now know that our impact was until then hidden by the oceans absorbing much of the excess heat. In this context, it is urgent to create solutions that enable our survival using natures and energies, solar, wind, wind, hydraulic and geothermal. The discussion of the third panel entitled Renewable Energies and IP 
relates to the need to produce electricity through nature that can be accelerated and perfected with cutting edge technology. The transportation sector is also an area which we need to focus on. What is certain is what we will have to move towards a sustainable transport, more respectful to the environment and with a focus on alternative fuels. The fourth panel under the theme sustainable transport of the future will show us how this sector envisions the future of transportation and what is the role of IP in this process. The fifth panel under the theme of green technologies and sustainability in the primary sector will discuss how cork, a Portuguese national resource, can be used to produce energy without the need to cut down trees. This is a way to contribute, not, to, contribute to not only to stopping deforestation, but also to a decrease in the use of fossil fuels. Also, in this panel, we will have the opportunity to understand the new approaches regarding agri-food process and how, through green innovation, they can reverse the negative impacts of this activity on the environment. In the sixth and final panel, we intend to understand how the con concept of smart cities, which has been so present in all of those interests in innovation, sustainability and mobility, could help the sustainability of the planet. Also, here we will discuss how innovation can be used to create modern cities thus encouraging the creation of new products in various sectors, prepared to prosper not only in the national market, but also in the international market. We foresee a new organization of world cities, making them cleaner and quieter. We end this event hearing from my colleague, Margarida Matias, member of the Directive Council of the Office. I would like to finish my introduction reminding, remembering that there are many differences between humans and the rest of the species on Earth. However, we are the most intelligent beings that have ever existed, since we are the only ones who can imagine the future. If so, we have the ability to manage our impact and rebuild the planet to be a healthier, and sustainable world. We need, we need to be faster and find the best solutions in IP. With this plan in place, we will finally learn how to live better on this planet, which is IP of all of us. I wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for the global picture of the webinar which I am certain will allow us to reflect about the world we want to live in. Let's now proceed with a presentation of the WIPO Green Project, of which INPI is a partner, by Mrs. Marianne Dietrich, WIPO Director, who will give us an overview of this project and focus on its latest developments. Mrs. Marianne Dietrich, the floor is yours. Let me just share my screen because I have a few slides. Okay, and in presentation mode. Are we, there we go. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Marion, but you can all call me Amy. Everyone does. Amy Dietrich, I am the director of WIPO's Global Challenges Division here in Geneva. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you today, World Intellectual Property Day. So happy World IP Day, everyone. I do have a few slides I wanted to show to you today. And this is the structure of my presentation. So first, I'll, f I'll spend just a few minutes walking through WIPO and global challenges and how WIPO engages in that space. I will then introduce you to WIPO Green of which INPI Portugal is one of our newest members and we're very excited to have them on board. 
I'll talk a little bit about WIPO Green's activities in both the food security and the climate change space. And then I'll introduce you to just a few of the resources that we have uh, that can help the world to meet the climate change related SDGs. So without further ado, let me present to you briefly, um, WIPO defines global challenges in three main spaces as being really, and I should say these are global policy spaces, as being really highly pertinent uh, to the IP space. And we believe that IP and technology can very much contribute to addressing these challenges. So if you look on the slide, you see that the three large circles, one is health, one is food security, and one is climate change. And these are the three main global policy areas that WIPO addresses uh, in my division, in the global challenges division. And if you look at the arrows, you can see that what we are explaining is that these are all interrelated, that food security is going to impact health and climate change, climate change is going to impact health and food security, and on and on and on. So we can't address one of these areas without addressing the other two. And can, to continue setting the scene for my presentation, I wanted to show you the global risk landscape. Uh, and this is for 2021. And what this is, is the World Economic Forum every year publishes a global risk landscape. And they ask business leaders uh, and major NGO leaders around the world, what in, in your view are the largest global risks for the coming year? And that's both in terms of likelihood and impact. And if you look at this, the x-axis is likelihood. And the further you go to the right, the more likely uh, global leaders feel this risk will happen. And if you look at the y-axis, as you travel up, that's impact. So the higher you go up on the y-axis, axis, the greater the impact would be if an event of that nature manifested. And you see that things are color coded according to their various sectors. So a blue triangle means this is an economic risk that's been identified. A green triangle, an environmental risk, an orange triangle, a geopolitical risk, a red triangle, a societal risk, and a purple triangle, a technological risk. And if you look at this scatter chart, you can see that the top five of six identified glo global risks for this year that we're currently in are environmental. And if I read them out, they are climate action failure, biodiversity loss, natural resource crises, human environmental damage, and extreme weather. And the only non-environmental associated risk that we have this year as identified by global business leaders is infectious diseases, which as you can imagine is referring to COVID-19. So the global community really seems to recognize and be coalescing around the fact that the biggest risks really facing not only business but humanity uh, this year, and I think probably it's safe to say for the decades and centuries to come, are very much environmental risks. Now, if you look at the chart on the right-hand side of this slide, this is the atmospheric CO2 concentration in parts per million, starting in, you know, obviously going way back to, to pre-industrial. I mean, here we're looking at about uh, 1 AD. That's all the way on the left. And then, of course, you see this very dramatic rise right around the Industrial Revolution that gains just unimaginable speed. Uh, starting in about 1950, and this chart finishes at 2016, where you can see we are at 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, which is uh, when you compare to what this was in pre-industrial years, um, the, the Earth's atmosphere has clearly never seen uh, a concentration like this, at least not in the past 2,000 years. So where does that put us? That puts us needing to do something about this. Uh, and so we at WIPO and at WIPO Green believe that technology can really help us to address these challenges, especially the challenges that have such a strong 
uh, let's say, human-made component. But we also recognize that the uptake of green technology and the replacing of older fossil fuel-based technologies is too slow. And we think that part of this delay and this slowness is due to a lack of information, but also, you know, perhaps markets not entirely functioning as they should. So what we would like to do at WIPO Green is to use the IP system and the knowledge that it generates to help disseminate these green technologies faster and further. And these are some quotes uh, from John Doerr, who is a venture capitalist and an investor in the U.S., who says that there has never been a better time to start or uh, accelerate a green tech venture than now, and that green technology could be the largest economic opportunity of the 21st century. So clearly, we have the need for these technologies, but there's also the opportunity for them to really blossom. And the final slide I have for the scene setting is just to remind everyone of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So WIPO is a UN specialized agency. We are, of course, very focused on contributing to these goals. And if you look at the 17 goals, it's actually hard to choose any goal for which environmental health does not play some kind of role. So it's clear that addressing the climate challenge is really going to be one of the main ways that we are actually able to achieve these goals. So now I'd like to move on to the part of my presentation where I introduce you to WIPO Green. So I've been setting the scene for the first few minutes of my presentation, and now I'd like to let you know what, what WIPO is doing about it. About seven years ago, we launched, we launched WIPO Green, and it is essentially an online platform for the accelerated adaptation, adoption, and deployment of green technology solutions. Now, you might want to ask how. Well, it's essentially a marketplace for green technology. Uh, and essentially what we're doing is we are connecting the seekers of environmentally sustainable solutions with the technology developers and service providers with the ultimate goal of enabling the faster adaptation and uptake of green technologies. Now to do this, of course we are WIPO, so we engage heavily with the private sector, but we're also working very closely with our fellow UN agencies with IP offices from around the world, with NGOs, uh, and with a really broad cross-section of stakeholders. And of course, as a UN specialized agency, we're also feeding all of this knowledge back into global policy dialogues around climate change and the environment. So some of our latest statistics, as I say, we've been around for about seven going on eight years now. We now have approximately 10,000 visitors a month to the WIPO Green web pages. We have, well, actually, we're close to almost 8,000 newsletter subscribers now. And if I do say so myself, it's an excellent resource. And we're also very actively using WIPO's social media channels. Uh, and communications channels to continually promote WIPO Green and to share case studies and success stories of matches that we have made through the platform. So what does this look like? Well, first we have our, our database, which is essentially the, the core of WIPO Green. This is where uh, multinational corporations and SMEs and universities are coming to list the green technologies that they have developed. It's also where governments and businesses and other entities looking for those technologies come to list their needs. We also have rolled into this an experts database, so green technology experts, and those can include on the IP end of things and also more on the startup and financing end of things. Now, of course, in addition to our database and our platform, we also have some, some in-person activities that we call acceleration projects, where we identify a specific sector and a specific sub-regional focus based on demand from member states. And we physically work with locally based consultants to design oftentimes in-person matchmaking activities activities where we are bringing technology seekers and technology providers together. So you can see on the slide what have been our focus areas for the acceleration projects uh, since 2015. And you'll notice that this year 
It is all about palm oil mill effluent in Indonesia. Palm oil mill effluent is a major emitter of greenhouse gases, um, first and foremost among, among them being methane. And so what we seek to do in this project is to produce a catalog of the best available technologies. And we usually try to find locally available technologies to increase the, the chance that they will actually be used and disseminated. But of course, we can also look outside of a country or a region and source technologies internationally. So what does the WIPO Green Partnership look like? Well, I'm pleased to report that we have well over 100 partners all around the world. And WIPO Green's partners are normally quite involved in, in WIPO Green. And we have regular meetings with them, regular communication opportunities, regular project opportunities. It's very dynamic. Now, if you look at the various circles around the globe, you can see exactly how strong is the participation in WIPO Green from each region. Now here, the blue dots are representing the numbers of technologies that have been uploaded from that region onto the WIPO Green database. And what I would like to point out here, because this isn't an event that's associated with, the, with Portugal's presidency of the EU, is that the blue dot over Europe is not as big as we would like it to be. So we would like that blue dot, which represents the number of technologies from Europe on the database, to be much, much bigger than it is. Uh, we would also love to see the red dot, which represents the needs. We would love to see that grow, as well as the orange dot, which represents the partners. Now, also looking at this chart, you can see that we have very robust participation from Asia and from North America, and that we are making a conscious effort to grow in Latin America, Africa, and Australasia. We do currently have close to 2,000 registered users of the WIPO Green database, and it's absolutely free to use the database and also to register for an account. We are approaching 4,000 uploaded green technologies, and we have over 250 needs. And I don't have time to go into it today, but um, identifying the demand for green technology is one of the most interesting and complex parts of WIPO Green. So here's a list of the members that we currently have, the partners um, of WIPO Green across the European continent. As you can see, there are 38 of them in total. Um, I won't read out each of them, but we are happy to welcome, I believe, NP. Uh, Portugal is our very first partner from Portugal, so we were quite happy to welcome them just a few months ago. Now, if we look at uploads from Europe in the WIPO Green database, we see a total of 404 technologies that have been uploaded by European entities and 49 needs. And that one to 10 ratio is pretty typical. That's actually what we see across the database, that for every one need, there's about 10 technologies that have been uploaded. So identifying and uploading needs is a real challenge for us. Most of the submissions coming from Europe are coming in the area of energy, followed by pollution and waste, and farming and forestry. And we have 450 active users from across Europe, including 12 from Portugal. And what this uh, icon at the top of the slide is showing you is the percentage of technologies in each of the specific categories. So almost 40% of all the technologies on WIPO Green's database are in the area of energy, greener, cleaner energy. And that's followed by pollution and waste, and then products, processes, and materials. And one of the sections that is growing the fastest on the database is farming and forestry. So I will wrap up because I know my time is quickly coming to an end. Just wanted to let you all know that we are completely re rebuilding the WIPO Green database. Uh, and it's actually going to move from a rather rudimentary database of technology listings to what is essentially a green business intelligence platform. So we will be adding connections with WIPO's patent scope database, which as you know, uh, contains PCT applications that have been tagged um, as by the IPC green inventory. So we will be increasing the collaboration even from within WIPO to import more green patents into the WIPO green database. Uh, we will have 
dramatically improved search and filter functions. You will be able to use natural language, meaning that you can go to the WIPO Green database and type in a full sentence as you would speak it. Uh, so for example, I would like to find solar panel technology, you know, based on the weather conditions in, you know, it's so that is going to be quite a powerful search function. And the database will also be smarter. We will have AI assisted needs and searches. Uh, we will have an AI assisted patent to solution function, and we will do suggested auto matching between needs and technologies, as well as user interaction tools. So think of it like almost the LinkedIn for green business technologies. Now, what are the benefits? of uploading your technology or your need to the WIPO Green database. It's free of charge international promotion. We are checking uh, all of the technologies that are uploaded to the best of our abilities and thinking of potential matches as well as who else could be interested. You are then able to connect with a very large network of green technology experts um, as well as providers and seekers. We are able to link you up with potential collaborators, investors, and licensees. And then, of course, there's the possibility to participate in WIPO Green activities, including regional matchmaking events, green tech exhibitions, partner events, and there's a discount on WIPO's arbitration and mediation services. So my final slide before I say thank you is just to show you who are WIPO Green's partners. And as you can see, this is a very multicolored pie chart. So we are working with a broad range of stakeholders, including intergovernmental organizations, multinational companies, SMEs, which is the theme of this year's World IP Day, think tanks, universities, NGOs, business associations, uh, and of course, extremely importantly, IP offices. They're all in there. And we would love to hear from you and to be able to count on your support as well. So I will conclude my presentation there and I will thank you very much for your attention. Happy World IP Day and don't hesitate to reach out to me with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, if you allow for me to say that, for your interesting presentation. I love the idea of a LinkedIn of green technologies and uh, uh, green partners. We hope to get it soon. And now, with no further ado, please welcome Mr. Ian Menier, Chief Economist from the European Patent Office, that will address the theme Innovation in Batteries and Electricity Storage. It is my pleasure to give Mr. Ian Menier the floor. Thank you very much and uh, uh, good afternoon everyone and thank you uh, uh, for the invitation and opportunity to share this, uh, to make this uh, intervention. Um, so it, it was uh, said just before by Amy, so innovation technology is critical in uh, tackling climate change. Uh, to cite a figure from uh, the partner uh, in our in the study that we present today, the International Energy Agency, uh, in order to achieve uh, carbon neutrality, so the net zero uh, by 2050, 50% uh, of the carbon emission reductions depend on technologies that are not available in the market yet, that are, that are still to be developed. So there is a major innovation uh, challenge in any attempt in any serious attempt to, to reach the, uh, the zero carbon emission target. And this makes it uh, uh, very important to inform uh, policymakers and uh, uh, business decision makers about the technology landscape uh, in order to, to help them uh, build up their, their innovation strategies and orient themselves uh, towards the, the energy transition. And this is the, pur the purpose of the partnership that we established with the International Energy Agency uh, last year. Uh, which is to, to use the expertise of the, of the European Patent Office, our 4,000 uh, expert examiners, in searching uh, uh, patent information to uh, inform policymakers into technology trends related to, uh, to the energy transition. So the, the study I'm going to, to present today is the first result of this collaboration, and it's focused on, uh, on batteries and electricity storage, which is one of the, of the key building blocks of the, of the energy transition. So let me, let me, before going into the, the data, let, let me explain um, a bit why uh, energy storage is so important. 
So you, you certainly know of uh, batteries in the context of uh, smartphones, of uh, consumer electronics, in the context of cars. Uh, but uh, actually, this belongs to, to a bigger picture of the energy transition. There are two key elements uh, where electricity storage is necessary in the, in the energy transition. The first one is that uh, one condition to reduce carbon emissions uh, is to, uh, uh, to make the demand side uh, shift to electricity instead of fuels, uh, for instance, in terms of, uh, of fossil fuels. So uh, electric vehicles are, are an obvious uh, example. Uh, but much more uh, sectors need to shift uh, uh, to electricity as a, as a source of energy. And this requires storage solutions like batteries. Uh, the second uh, uh, instance where uh, el electricity storage and in particular batteries are, are very much needed is on the supply side. So uh, um, the demand for energy needs to shift towards electricity and electricity needs to become uh, green, uh, renewable. But the problem with the renewable electricity is that it's uh, intermittent. It's, it depends on the seasons. It depends uh, on the, the wind, the sun. It's not constant. And so it's difficult to balance it with demand. In, and in order to properly balance it, you need storage capacity. So for these two reasons, uh, uh, electricity storage is a key component of the energy transition. And uh, it's foreseen by the uh, International Energy Agency that uh, the deployment uh, of uh, electricity storage uh, should be multiplied by 50. The annual deployment uh, should be multiplied by 50 uh, uh, before 2040 uh, in order to reach the, the energy transition scenario that they, they foresee uh, to achieve carbon neutrality. So this is a massive figure and this is not possible based on today's technology. This requires a lot of innovation in electricity storage in general and batteries in particular. So, uh, and the good news is that the market, the industry is responding to that. And uh, on this chart, uh, you have uh, an illustration of the, the trend of, uh, of patenting related to electricity storage since 2000. And uh, you see a, a massive increase. It's the blue, uh, the blue curve, uh, the, the dark blue curve. And uh, uh, actually, the, the light blue curve is the, is the same trend for all technologies. And uh, uh, this, uh, this shows that uh, uh, patenting related to electricity storage has been growing at an average growth of 14% uh, since 2005, so 14% every year. And this is four times faster than other international patents so in, in, other, in other technologies. Uh, so definitely we observe a boom uh, in uh, electricity storage innovation, which is a good news for, for the energy transition. And uh, uh, importantly, most of, uh, of this innovation has been focusing uh, on batteries. Actually, they represent 80% uh, of, the, of the patenting activities related to electricity storage and uh, using the expertise, the combined expertise of the IEA and of uh, EPO examiners. Uh, in this study, we have decomposed, uh, destructured this, uh, uh, this bulk of uh, this large number of patents related to batteries in, uh, in subfields in order to understand, to better understand and document the trends underlying the development, the technology development of batteries. And uh, uh, a first uh, finding, is that 80% uh, of this development is related to development at the cell level. So improving the, the batteries uh, uh, themselves, the core technology of the batteries. And there, over time, it has been focusing more and more on lithium and lithium ion batteries uh, that represent, again, about 80% of the, of the development uh, related to, uh, to, cell, uh, to cells. But uh, it's also interesting to, to note that 50% uh, uh, of this development, part of which inter uh, overlapping with lithium and lithium ion, are related to cell level manufacturing or engineering. Uh, so, in other words, in better ways of uh, producing, of manufacturing batteries at a, at a massive industrial scale. And this is a very important lesson uh, from the past 10 years. There has been a lot of innovation in bringing uh, this, uh, this technology to the market efficiently uh, in uh, making uh, gains in, uh, in the ability to manufacture much manufacturing them uh, on, a, on a very large scale. And this explains the, the dramatic fall in the cost of, uh, of batteries, the price of batteries during the past decade, uh, uh, about uh, uh, 90%. Uh, it's uh, another uh, interest of, uh, of uh, this way of mapping the technologies related to batteries is that we can observe also the sectors of application. And, and in, in order to do that, it's interesting to look uh, at the, the patents 
related to the integration of, uh, of battery packs in various types of uh, equipment. And here it's possible to make a difference between a portable application, so typically consumer electronics, automotive applications, uh, and stationary applications, that is batteries that support the balancing of the grid when, uh, when you have to deal with uh, intermittent uh, renewable energy. And uh, when you consider these three uh, sectors of application, you get a curve, uh, a chart like this one, where you can clearly see three waves of innovation related to batteries, actually. During the, the past uh, decade, so the, the, the decade 2000-2010, uh, innovation in batteries was dominated uh, by uh, portable applications, so electronics uh, typically. Uh, but then uh, you have a second wave that has been uh, uh, developing, rising, which is the light blue here, which is the use of batteries for automotive. And definitely today, uh, most of, so the bulk of innovation related to batteries is focused on automotive applications, but it has very much benefited uh, from the developments that were achieved for, for um, portable applications. The lithium-ion uh, batteries that were initially developed for portable electronics have been transposed often by the same players uh, uh, to electric vehicles. And finally, you see a nascent uh, wave, which is the third one, which is the, the use of batteries for stationary applications, so for electricity grids. This is only starting, but it's, it is expected by the International Energy Agency that uh, the, the need is as big as the need for automotive. And so we can expect a fast rise of innovation related to stationary applications, benefiting a lot from the, uh, the progress that has been made in batteries for automotive applications. Uh, as a result of this uh, succession of three waves, we also observe the entry of uh, new players uh, in, the, uh, in innovation for batteries. And this uh, is illustrated by this slide, which shows you uh, the five top applicants uh, in the field of, uh, of batteries. You see that uh, the first two ones were already very active in 2000, uh, uh, Samsung and Panasonic, and they were typically uh, active in the development of batteries for electronic applications. But uh, since 2005-2010, uh, you can observe the entry of, of new players like LG Electronics, Toyota, Bosch, and many more behind them. And these are companies that are typically uh, primarily focused on the development of batteries for automotive and that have, uh, which uh, entries has dramatic, dramatically accelerated the innovation trend related to, to batteries. And at the same time, old players incumbent like Samsung and Panasonic has also, have also developed uh, uh, te battery technology, started developing battery technology for, for automotive. Another way uh, to look at the origins of these, uh, these patents is to look at their geographical origin. And this is what you have uh, on this chart, which shows uh, the, or the origins of the inventors uh, for the five main uh, regions in the world, namely Japan, Korea, the, the, Europe, the countries of the European Patent Convention, China and the United States. And uh, it's uh, very clear, actually very striking uh, from this chart that uh, Japan is far uh, ahead uh, of the of the sector, actually, already in 2000 2010, uh, innovation in batteries was dominated by Japanese companies. But uh, thanks to the uh, the transfer of the expertise from consumer electronics uh, to automotive, they have further increased their leadership and are now uh, far ahead of uh, the other countries. Uh, in comparison, the other countries are very close to each other. Uh, but uh, if you look more closely at the curves, you see that uh, uh, well, Europe and the United States have kept uh, innovating in batteries. But in fact, China and Korea have started much later, especially uh, China, and have caught up very fast. Actually, China has caught up with the other regions in about 10 years and can be expected to, uh, 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 to do better uh, in the next decade uh, if, uh, if the trends uh, are continued. So there is definitely a race, uh, a race for, for this technology, which again is critical for the energy transition. And uh, it's a race where Europe uh, is not uh, in the lead and has, uh, is, is therefore facing uh, a big challenge. Uh, a last uh, slide that uh, I would like to share is a selection uh, of results from the study on, uh, on future technologies, so forthcoming technologies uh, in the battery industry. So uh, we are already very advanced with the lithium-ion technologies, but there is more coming. And in the, in the study, we, we document the, the different chemistries 
that are uh, about to be uh, in the market, just enter or just entered in, in the market. And probably the most interesting one uh, is the is solid state batteries. So uh, solid uh, solid state electrolytes that make uh, the batteries more performant in terms of charging times, in terms of capacity, in terms of uh, risk management also, they do not burst into flame. And uh, you see that uh, very clearly you have a, a patent trace uh, in that field, a very fast rise of, uh, of innovation related to, uh, to solid state. And if you look at the origins uh, of, these, uh, of these patents, you see that uh, the position of, uh, of Japan uh, is even stronger than uh, for the rest of, uh, of lithium ion technology. So you have, uh, again, a strong Japanese leadership, but also more than in the rest of batteries, uh, a strong position of the United States with 18% of the patent uh, families related to lithium uh, to uh, solid state uh, 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 batteries. So on, uh, on these uh, uh, elements, I will uh, conclude uh, my presentation and thank you for, for your attention. I uh, would like also to, to take the opportunity to mention that uh, our next study with the International, uh, uh, International Energy Agency will be published tomorrow. Uh, and uh, it uh, also looks uh, at batteries, but uh, puts them in, a, in the much broader uh, perspective of uh, all technologies related to low carbon energy. Uh, so that includes many more, many more technologies. And these, uh, uh, this study is entirely based on the, the EPO's dedicated scheme for climate change mitigation technologies, the so-called DWIO2 scheme, which is free for all interested uh, to use or to search uh, on ESPASnet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for, in, for our insightful speech and presentation, Jan. And tomorrow we will be waiting for the new study. Thank you so much. Let's now pass to an interesting panel that is intended to emphasize industrial property in the context of renewable energies and in particular wave and solar energy entitled Renewable Energies and Industrial Property. To that extent, I'll give the floor first to Mr. Juan Portillo, professor at Instituto Superior Técnico, one of the most relevant Portuguese universities, will speak about web energy, followed by Mr. Elder Gonçalves, Vice President of the National Laboratory of Energy and Geology, who will lecture about the relation between IP and solar energy. So, let's hear Mr. Juan Portillo and Mr. Elder Gonçalves. Hello, good afternoon. Sorry. Good afternoon. Yes, do you see the presentation, right? Perfect. Well, yes. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Juan Portillo, as I well said. I work at Instituto Superior Tecnico, and we prepared this presentation in conjunction with Professor Luis Gatto, who is the chief of the department um, related to re offshore renewable energy. So the presentation for today is entitled Wave Energy for Value Creation in Offshore Sectors. Um, all of us may have an idea that there, are, there is a lot of resource, uh, there is a lot of energy uh, in the waves out there. Actually, the theoretical wave resource has been estimated in 3.3 terawatts in terms of power every hour in the global consumption has been estimated, the global electricity consumption has been estimated in 2.8 terawatts every hour. So here in this slide, you can see a very large, a giant wave that, that is in Nazare here in Portugal. Here you can observe the patents evolution, the register patent evolution between 2009 and 2019. As you can, as you can see, seeing the universe of patents is around uh, 15,000 patents. 
in the last in the last year there has been a flatter let's say evolution of these patents but it's in agreement with other offshore or other renewable energy technologies like like for example tidal or wind from this global share of patents europe has a share of around 18 percent and portugal has a share of patent registered of around 1.8 percent it's uh, curious that the first evidence of a formal document uh, of, related to a wave energy converter was a patent that was registered in Paris the 12th of July of 1799. So it's almost uh, more than 220 years ago, the first uh, formal evidence for a wave energy converter. Here, I present a classification that was developed by Professor Antonio Falcão in 2010. Uh, professor Antonio Falcão is also uh, an active researcher and professor at the Instituto Superior Tecnico, and he classified the wave energy conversion of technologies in three great families. These families are oscillating water columns, oscillating body that involve one or two more, or, or two body, or more than two bodies and overtopping devices. Any, practically any of these technologies can be floating or can be fixed or maybe can be fixed to the sea bottom or to the shoreline structures. Here at Instituto Superior Tecnico, we have been devoted a lot of time researching in oscillated water columns. And why is that? Because they, they, they have a relatively uh, simplicity in their designs they also uh, involve very low forces in the power takeoff system conversions. As you can see here, this represents a power takeoff system that in the case of oscillated water columns are self-rectifying air turbines. How these devices work? Well, there is a physical structure like this one. In this case, we are seeing three figures. One is, the first one is a fixed oscillator wire column, and the last two are floating oscillator wire columns. In any case, there is a fixed, uh, a, a physical structure that is designed in such a way that the interaction with the incoming wave creates a displacement of um, an internal mass of water. And in consequence, there is an air chamber that that um, um, reciprocates air out and in from this air chamber. It is curious that the first oscillated water column constructed was in France, in Coyon, near Bordeaux, and it was around 1910. Here in Portugal, we have, we have also constructed a very important project, demonstration project that was in, in the Azores, in the, uh, in the Pico Island, uh, several years ago, and the device was uh, active for around 20 years. It's already this month now. Well, one, one way to try to, to get to commercialization of this type of technology that we have visualized is the segmentation of the markets, because every segment of the markets that are presented here uh, have certain characteristics. For example, we have, we have idealized uh, or conceived a segment of the market for very small consumers, and uh, other small and medium consumers and large consumers. In the case of the large consumers, we are talking about utilities mainly, and those uh, and those consumers that need to somehow um, connect uh, the the systems to a network to transmit normally electrical uh, electrical energy. In the other two cases, probably the most interesting to get the, the, this type of technologies into commercialization are the very small consumers, for example, because the very small consumers are, for, um, for example, can support oceanographic applications, um, uh, research, uh, can, can support inspections through the use of, like this is the, depicting this picture, uh, automated underwater vehicles that need to be recharged and depending on the location and the far from the shore uh, can be can be beneficial to to have a, a, a charging dock station uh, offshore in the case of the in the case of the small and medium consumers we have a very vast lack of applications um, that we can uh, we can use 
uh, to leverage the, the, the wave energy uh, power. For example, we can use uh, small platforms or single devices to provide power to um, aquaculture um, exploitation or to uh, green hydrogen production or to desalinization, for example. So it's, it's very vast the number of applications that we, we can conceive or we can support with the use of, of these devices. And normally in these small and medium consumers, we are talking about more standalone system. Just imagine just an electrical plug just in the middle of the ocean. I bring to you two examples. One of them is a multipurpose platform uh, technologies that we are developing at Instituto Superior Tecnico. And uh, these type of platforms can have several sizes and several number of, uh, of producing units. In the case I'm showing you here, we are talking about a technology that we have named coaxial dot oscillator wire columns. Um, as you can see here, this is another type of platform. It's very versatile. We can have it very close to shore. We can have them instead of floating platform, like fixed platform, and they can support the activities even of floating cities, just for you to have an idea. Um, in the, one of the advantages of this type of conception is its modularity and scalability that can be matched according to user needs. This will foster, of course, the commercialization endeavors. In this case, it's an example of the different efforts that we have developed for research and development. In this case, I'm presenting this multipurpose platform uh, comprised or composed by five uh, oscillated water columns. And, the, and what you're observing here uh, is, a, is a large prototype test that was uh, deployed in Plymouth in the UK. Uh, for a model of one to the 40 scale. Um, we can consider that this technology is in a technology readiness level between three and four. Of course, any, any wave energy converter will need um, a power takeoff system, which is a system that converts the energy from the primary source to a useful energy, uh, for example, electricity. What you are seeing here, for example, is a near turbine that is used in, that normally are used in oscillator water columns. This is a working full-size prototype that was deployed at Motriku Wave Power Plant, which is an oscillator, a set of chambers or oscillator water columns integrated in a break water in the north of Spain. In the, in, the, in the right side, you can see uh, the same turbine that was deployed later on in a floating oscillator water column. This is of the spark buoy type. Um, of course, with this industrial property protection, uh, like, like the ones that we possess, that we possess for this type of air turbines, um, we have licensee, for example, the rights for deployment in Europe and also in Instituto Superior Tecnico has uh, the rights in several countries around the world. This leverage, um, first of all, for us, uh, the access to funds in order to further research and develop the technology in order to improve it and make it more interesting for investors. And of course, improving also the commercialization uh, path and the bankability of this type of asset. For me, is that the presentation I had for you. Thank you very much for your attention. And I pass the floor to the people. Thank you for the uh, the invitation and uh, thank you for the invitation. My name is Elve Gonzalez. I'm a researcher and director of the Energy Laboratory in Lisbon. So I, I came here to talk about the Beatles. Um, not exactly. I, I, I choose this Here Comes the Sun in order to to speak a little bit about how can you use the sun. 
Uh, in fact, I, I, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, the use of solar energy and how we can use better the solar energy and which are the technologies that uh, um, we, we can use uh, on solar energy. Well, in this slide, you, you, you can see the, the, the potential of the solar radiation in, in Europe and in the Mediterranean area. And, uh, and, and you can see the difference of colors. Of course, we will not enter in details that uh, uh, the South European countries has uh, uh, a big potential in terms of uh, solar radiation. And, um, and th this potential can, can be used uh, using different technologies and um, local projects, big projects, uh, regional projects. And uh, in the next 10 years, um, the solar energy will be a key issue against the climate change. That's definitely is, 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 um, is for sure. But the point is, and I, one of the main messages that I would like to, to, to share with you, we have technology. The technology is under development very quickly. And, but the user, the user, the final user, the citizens uh, have to in mind that uh, he, he could have a decision on which energy I'm going to use as a personal, as a, a family, in my company, and so on. This, this will make the difference. It's not only this potential. The potential exists, but from the potential to the end use, there are differences. Well, <clears throat> more seriously, as you can, uh, everyone knows, uh, there, there, every um, European countries as, uh, uh, is, a, uh, is national energy and climate uh, plan um, is mandatory. Every uh, European countries has the plan. And as you can see here, the, the, our goal uh, in Portugal is to achieve 47% of, of our consumption in 2030 with renewables. This is a very, a very impressive goal. And if we talk about electricity, uh, the, the figures are, are quite high. Uh, the figures for ele renewable electricity is 85% in 2030 and 95% in 2050. Okay, it, it, it is, is, is a, a, a big challenge that every one of us can help. So, but let, let me go to this, uh, this uh, table, just to point it out that uh, among the technologies, uh, solar PV is, is the, uh, where we will see um, the big effort in Portugal. Uh, the idea is to achieve nine gigawatts on power in 2030. That, that's, I really repeat, it, it's nine gigawatts for Portugal on PV. Uh, I will talk a little bit uh, later on on that. The other technologies, well, of course, I will not talk about hydro and wind, but wind is, is the winner. Wind is the winner because it, it will grow until 9.3 gigawatts. Um, we have a, a potential uh, and important technology on CSP uh, that we are involved in several projects. That is, is in the beginning of, uh, uh, of uh, big projects, but uh, is, they are so expensive that uh, cannot compete at the moment. The point is the technology, the PV technology, the price is, is, is quite low and that, that's why uh, we'll achieve it for sure, this, this value. But we can, we, we have, the solar can do much more for us uh, on lighting our buildings, warm our houses. It, it seems simple, but, but that's where, where, where you can choose to uh, eat our wa water. That, that's uh, one of the, 
big consumption that we have in the residential sector, and <clears throat> of course, electricity. What we are seeing now, uh, now under underway, and uh, the next 10 years, we'll see all over the country, is these large uh, photovoltaic solar power plants. And uh, power plants that uh, a few years ago we couldn't imagine, but uh, this is uh, an example of one of 46 megawatts in the south of Portugal, where we have much more sun and a PV uh, power plant. But uh, I, I have a check on the last uh, week about the, the magazines uh, and what, what, what's going on. And, and I see uh, incredible projects in, 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 uh, in Portugal, uh, mainly in South. For example, 257 megawatts in Evora, uh, one gigawatt. Uh, announce, well, this is a discussion project, yes, G one gigawatt with Tesla batteries, uh, uh, 144 from Gulp, uh, also in the deep south. So the market is, is, is working very quickly. These technologies are increasing very quickly. And uh, the, uh, with the batteries, uh, they will respond to what we heard in the previous uh, presentations about uh, the, 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 the problem of storage that uh, we don't have time to talk here. But uh, um, of course, there are other businesses, the, uh, the big supply to, to, for instance, FNAC that buy only renewables and so on. That, so this is the, the, the market on the PV power plants. The most important thing here I would like to point it out is these two gigawatts that is, is part of the nine that I presented before in buildings. That, and that is where we can do something. And, and in this slide, we, we see what I mean, uh, um, which is the, uh, the building integration photo photovoltaics in buildings. So here, the technology is really, is really doing uh, very nice things. Um, we, we, we see at the moment, uh, I don't, didn't bring the figures, but uh, we have PVs in all kinds of materials, all kinds of colors. Uh, we'll see in the next years, not only on the building envelopes or or in the terraces, but in, in windows, because we will have uh, different uh, translucent materials that we can buy and, and just put it wh wherever we, we, we want. And uh, it's, it's a question of uh, uh, a couple of years that uh, they are really cheap and we can, can use it very quickly. So uh, this is a, a big revolution is not only the PV itself at the level of the, the big power plants, but at the uh, local level, at the level of the buildings. Talking about buildings, that's another uh, key message I would like to, to tell you. Zero, zero, net zero energy buildings. Net zero energy buildings. This is not a vision, this is the reality. Now, uh, the idea is that the buildings will produce uh, what they need in, in energy terms. They can produce uh, a lot or not enough, but uh, the idea is to produce something, and this something could be uh, everything. And when I say it's not an idea and a vision, that's because there are a directive that is starting in January last year, that all new buildings need to have this concept, net zero energy building. Well, I don't have much time to, to go through, but already the architects used before the so-called passive solar, which was the, the, the building envelope with some of the systems that can use and better collect the solar in buildings. This is something that uh, uh, the architects use very much since the last decades. 
And we, we, we have this technology in buildings built all over the world, in, even in Portugal. But this is the kind of buildings that uh, we'll see in the future. Uh, actual, this is a, a, a community, an energy community in Germany. And you see, the, the, you remember the first slide, they don't have much energy, solar energy compared with us, but they are doing this. This, this is not net zero, this is a plus energy buildings. They produce more than the, what they need. So they, 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 they put the, on the grid, they sell the, the extra uh, energy that they, they produce. So we'll see more and more the technology with more efficiency in, in, this, um, in these PV systems. So, uh, and, and we can choose it. We, we, we can choose to put in our houses because the prices will be uh, really uh, interested in, in the future. So, the idea is that uh, uh, buildings, communities, cities, will be a mixing um, situation of net zero energy buildings uh, with a decentralized system, which uh, uh, the wind, geothermal, solar, biomass, whatever on renewables uh, can, can contribute depending on the site, on, on latitude. Uh, there are huge opportunities and uh, I agree with the, everyone says that the green technology is, is a good business now for uh, and, and the, the number of technologies and the patents which are now underway is, is really incredible. So let's use it as, as users. I have just two more remarks. One I cannot uh, uh, forget is, is the simplest one. Just let choose a, a solar thermal water water. We don't have much in Portugal. That's amazing. Uh, the Greeks have, the Spanish have, uh, Malta, Cyprus, Austria. Austria has been in the last years uh, the, the country that uh, buy more uh, solar thermal for water water, which is incredible. So we have different technologies for this type of use. Let's use it. It's cheap and we can do much for our budget and for the, uh, the climate change. And this is the last slide. Uh, it's an example of uh, one of our buildings in, in, in Lunac that we built some, some years ago. It's a net zero energy building. We are very proud of that. Uh, we have uh, different technologies for um, eating, cooling, and there are no air condition in this building, just geothermal, solar, and we have a building that we don't use uh, conventional energy. So that's my message for you. We have the sun, let's use it. And thank you very much again. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Juan and Elder, for your very interesting approaches to the team. What a big challenge that any one of us can help and also contribute for. Angel, uh, Angel Ramalho, just a moment, please. Okay, I'll wait. <laughs> now let's a uh, future look to the sustainable transport of the future, listening to Mr. Angel Ramalho, CEO of one of the greatest Portuguese companies, EFASEC. Dear Mr. Angel Ramalho, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, let me share uh, my presentation. It's working. OK. 
Okay, let me share again. Okay, thank you very much. Is it working? Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, thank you very much. I think it's not running. Okay, that's it. Well, um, I will start uh, talking on, on transport, but, uh, but um, um, referring uh, and always referring uh, the new paradigm that we are living in energy. As um, it was talked during, during this afternoon, um, uh, paradigm is, is, is changing and I tried to exemplify it uh, in, this, uh, in this slide. Uh, um, uh, in 2050, we expect to have more 60% 60 of the uh, final uh, electricity con consumption. And uh, to fulfill these needs, uh, um, uh, probably uh, things will uh, have um, a great change. Uh, as you can see right now in 2020, we'll still have coal uh, in the base of our system, of our uh, uh, power producing system. And in the next few years, coal will decrease in relative terms, of course. Uh, gas will maintain, uh, nuclear will maintain, uh, oil will fade out and is fading out very fast. Uh, hydro will maintain, wind and solar um, uh, are rising. And here comes the sign, very interesting, that, uh, that idea, Elder, very interesting. Here comes the sign. Um, uh, he, 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 will, he will have a very, a very uh, strong role in this, um, in this um, way that we have to, to do uh, in terms of uh, keeping, keeping this planet uh, uh, um, um, a place for every, everybody of, of us. And of course, this uh, energy, this renewable energy is promoting this uh, silent revolution in the, in the side of mobility. Without it, it was not, it was not possible. Uh, I'm referring here uh, uh, the um, battery electric vehicles, but th this is only a part and probably a small part of, uh, a small part of the equation. It's more visible right now. It's rising uh, and you can see that, uh, um, uh, in the next uh, in the next few years, 2025, even if global investment it's not uh, is, is not having a very big a very big growth, the the, the the investment in battery electric vehicles will double, uh, and this is this is very significant. More than 1,600 electric vehicle models will be presented in this period, and this year we are assisting uh, um, to. Uh, um, uh, a few, uh, a very, a very interesting presentations on the on this side. Of course, I'm just referring uh, what is related with with vehicles, uh, um, battery electric ve vehicles. But in infrastructures and infrastructures are, are moving fast in order to address these these needs of uh, of, of consumption. Of, of course, ev everybody is moving, trying to to reach uh, carbon neutrality. Um, it's not an easy way. Uh, uh, some of, of these countries are, are moving faster than others. Probably the most developed ones are moving faster. But 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 I believe I, I believe that we believe that everybody is 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 going to to address this carbon neutrality target uh, and uh, um, um, very soon. Um, sorry. Um, and in the very end, uh, we are living. Most of us live in the cities and. Uh, and cities uh, will be the center of universe. Um, the uh, uh, urbanization phenomena is moving. Um, uh, we are living in, uh, in, uh, in bigger and bigger metropolitan, metropolitan areas. And of course, uh, trying, to, trying to find uh, um, comfort, reliability, uh, and, and in systems that tend to be more and more and more, and more complex. And how we address this complexity uh, of course, in this in this case, related with infrastructure, uh, this is all infrastructure, uh, uh, um, smart buildings, uh, public lighting, uh, um, smart mobility, um, everything, uh, uh, water uh, and sweat and and switch. This is all infrastructure. And how do we address uh, to manage this infrastructure in in order to to have it available, uh, addressable um, in a, a, a comfortable and convenient way uh, for for uh, everybody? 
and uh, um, uh, foc focusing on mobile on mobility um, of course um, the, the focus should be uh, first and second um, in, in smooth models uh, um, of transport uh, and done in public transport uh, once again uh, we tend to see electric mobility focus in uh, in the battery electric vehicles or even hybrid vehicles but uh, uh, public transport is the is the backbone of, of, of mobility of course public transport in an electricity mode uh, is the backbone of the of the um, uh, mobility systems and uh, they must be addressed in a convenient in a convenient uh, in a convenient way uh, and we are doing it in Portugal, uh, not at the same pace uh, when uh, when when we talk uh, to, to to private vehicles uh, or, or smart solutions and uh, related to to, to these inf infrastructures. In, in in fact, in the last ten years, uh, probably Portugal, uh, um, a small country, a small economy, uh, but we did our role um, as challengers. Uh, um, and the, uh, very early, we started promoting uh, uh, an infrastructure to, to, to enable the development of uh, electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. Uh, this program, OVE, uh, it was a pioneer program in Europe. Um, uh, and of course, nothing uh, um, always referring that this country has a, a, um, a cluster related to automotive industry that represents 25% of uh, annual uh, exports. And this is very significant. In the other way, um, the slow pace in the in the public infrastructure. Uh, I'm referring uh, a, a few a few um, half a dozen uh, examples of projects that are that, that are announced to be developed or announced to be started, uh, and those developments are or or the starting point for those projects have been del and, uh, and uh, have been systematically delayed. Hope. Uh, in this um, in this bazooka period, all this all this stuff goes on uh, finally. And in terms of uh, electric mobility, it's uh, it's easy to say that we are in a in a in a um, in an eminent turning point, uh, more visible uh, in the light of in the side of um, of um, electric vehicle. And as you can see, uh, a few a few uh, examples not only of uh, uh, declarations, but but they are facts. Um, uh, uh, car manufacturers are moving fast and, and very fast for, for electric mobility, but uh, we are seeing um, interesting moves uh, in, in, um, um, in other, other, other sectors, uh, of course, with other uh, technological and the logistics issues to solve, but uh, everybody's moving uh, to, 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 take the, to take the place. And related with ports, uh, I, I just uh, I just put here an an, an example uh, how we can address uh, in one side and in the right side of this slide uh, new forms of uh, of power of energy production uh, from wind and solar and uh, as we as we as we are assisting uh, but waste to energy and hydrogen and then systems uh, to integrate all these uh, different different uh, energy modes. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of network to supply to the final to the final user in the in the left side uh, it will be a, it will be a, a, in the harbor um, uh, a few kind of uh, of um, of, uh, of vessels a ferry a cruise and the, and the cargo and the cargo ship uh, they uh, that that can use uh, in the in very near future uh, new forms of uh, of energy uh, uh, like uh, like batteries, uh, electrical energy, like hydrogen, um, 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 or uh, new forms uh, of energy produced on on um, uh, uh, oil and gas, uh, um, uh, more friendly oil and gas uh, uh, combustible, uh, and uh, all of these complex systems they they must be integrated. Of of course, uh, um, the communication systems and information systems. It will be. Uh, they will be the enablers, digital, it will be the, the, the enablers, and 5G, uh, it's, it will be very important in order to put this, uh, all, these, um, uh, all these points tech, tackling together and in, uh, in real time. Uh, so um, the digital layer, uh, it will be present, uh, 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 it is present right now, and it will be the real enabler. Uh, let me uh, uh, let me uh, once again emphasize that uh, energy um, and mobility um, are always uh, together, uh, and of course related with the electric mobility, 
um, uh, only um, uh, electric energy uh, from renewable sources, um, uh, it, will, it will match uh, the equation. Um, and what are the smart mobility trends? Uh, probably, um, more than probably, next generation, next generation buses will utilize uh, silent electric power, power trains uh, and they will reduce air and noise pollution. They will be autonomous, aut autonomous very probably, uh, relying on in integrated systems uh, of onboard sensors and, and, and computers, uh, in, in, in interacting with the rest of city, city infrastructure. Um, probably uh, for payment solutions, we will have um, universal travel accounts um, or smartphones that are, that are enabled with near field co communications that provide an integrate, uh, integrated payment solutions for um, every transportation user. Um, uh, probably we have um, many other uh, enablers uh, uh, of experience looking looking to this for the system and uh, offering uh, more relaxing and uh, productive or entertaining um, the intrinsic experience uh, uh, and we will see content providers uh, in vehicle service providers that data and analytics companies advertisers whatever all these communities uh, will be uh, enabling this uh, new 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 experience um, uh, new planning solutions for uh, multimodal transportation um, 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 fully personalized uh, solutions and 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 uh, and guidance dynamic pricing um, with the rise of um, mobile technology and the internet of things uh, new dynamic pricing mechanisms that um, was not con conceivable uh, a few days, a few a few years ago, uh, and will enable pricing uh, based on variables such as uh, time, such of, uh, of time of the day, uh, road, road congestion, speed, uh, occupancy, uh, and even uh, fuel efficiency or carbon or carbon uh, emissions. Uh, all these, all these in. Uh, um, 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 all these challenges will be co will be conveniently addressed in the next few years, and we will assist to do this silent, silent silent revolution. Once again, energy and mobility together, um, um, uh, assisting assisting this development of uh, um, large scale renewables, and uh, as we saw in the in the in the, in, in the last presentation, uh, the distributed generation, smart building, as as we saw before. Um, uh, our role as uh, as uh, as um, producers, and uh, at the same time we are consumers, uh, um, and and the systems that uh, that integrate um, uh, everything, uh, batteries, uh, storage, and and uh, and other storage systems. Uh, and uh, uh, with a proper balance and convenient solutions, uh, in the very end, the, the electric vehicle is just um, it's just an electric vehicle. Uh, um, everything is is uh, fiery hound uh, electric electric vehicle. Even if it is uh, an electric uh, a vehicle uh, directly um, uh, connected to to the grid, or, or if it is a non a non connection and inductive inductive uh, charging. And um, um, uh, energy uh, in the center, once again, energy in the center. Uh, FASEC is an industrial company. Uh, we have uh, three strategic pillars. Uh, the first one is energy. Uh, the second is mobility. And the third is in environment. And what we do is to develop technologies and to integrate them uh, in order, in order uh, to fulfill uh, the requirements of, uh, uh, of today's challenge. Uh, uh, and our concept of uh, uh, energy hub, uh, we integrate local generation, uh, uh, photovoltaic and mi mi micro wind, um, uh, with uh, um, technologies for uh, for, for storage, uh, um, and uh, of course integrating all this stuff with the grid uh, and in an intelligent way, uh, um, uh, with, in a in a in a two sense communication. Uh, and this is uh, this is a schematic uh, a schematic presentation. Our he have digital energy have um, um, the buildings, the generation, um, the cars interacting with the grid, um, the batteries interacting interacting with 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 every, everyone, and management management systems in order to uh, in one side uh, to, to to promote uh, a friendly user interface. But in the other side, to balance all these all these uh, technologies in order to uh, maximize maximize 
their uh, their output. This is another another uh, presentation, more 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 visual. Uh, we don't do uh, solar panels. That's that's for Chinese. We do the the, the rest. Um, these 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 the chargers, um, vehicle chargers. These uh, these solutions in order to 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 storage and to integrate with uh, with uh, with the grid and the management systems that uh, assist all these all these um, all these technologies to make them um, usable. And that's all for me. Thank you for your thank you for, the, for your attention. Um, stressing on uh, mobility and energy together to solve a very important question in our, in our lives. Thank you, Angelo, for this interesting overview of the future that is already here. I would like to leave here a small challenge to FASEC. When it is possible to have chargers in all corners of our cities, I think it will be needed, and I think that FASEC. No, let would. me let me answer you. Um, it's a it's a challenge, a very yes. very interesting one, and we like it. Um, we like it. Uh, we are uh, technology developers and product de developers. We don't uh, we don't uh, um, uh, we are not operators. So yes, I know. We, we but, have the and we have the technology that uh, that uh, that uh, enables uh, um, uh, the needs of the market, and we have technologies for every type um, of utilization: private, public, um, uh, slow charge or ultra fast charge. Um, uh, but it, it's it's important to say that um, um, even if we are moving um, in an exponential way. Uh, um let's let's do it step by step um i referred only the investment in the side of um, um car manufacturers uh, uh, the the investment in the in the in the side of if infrastructure if is probably no it's not probably is even bigger than what it is know. needed for car car inf infrastructures so um to have uh, those investment capacities and the industrial capacity to solve all these issue in a short period of time probably it would be not uh, reasonable so let's let's move uh, we are moving fast uh, we are moving fast um, every every growth scenario you can choose um, probably it will be uh, even faster than 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 we imagine and uh, the reality is here um, um, but not so quick, uh, not, not, it's not magic. Uh, we know that, unfortunately. We need, we need lots of investment, lots yeah, of investment. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo, for your very, very interesting presentation. about green technologies and sustainability in the primary sector. And no one better to speak about this team than the CEO of Amarine Cork Composites. Mr. João Azved will speak about Cork and its innovative, innovative uh, functionalities, sorry. And also Mrs. Maria de Fátima Carvalho, professor at the Polytechnic Institute of Beja, will speak about a new approach in every food process. With no further ado, please welcome Mr. João Pedro Azevedo and Mrs. Maria de Fátima Carvalho. The floor is yours. Okay, first of all, thank you very much. Are you watching to my presentation already? Yes? Yes, João Pedro. Okay, so it's always a pleasure to, to, to be able and having the opportunity to show what we do and uh, how we do it. And uh, 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 let me just... Okay, so uh, first, uh, and, 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 uh, and, um, and probably this should be, let's say, the first uh, topic, what is cork? Mostly for those that are not uh, Portuguese, basically cork is the outer bark of the cork oak tree, like the skin of the tree that we harvest each nine years. We take it, okay, we strip uh, the, 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 the skin, like peeling the skin of the tree. We don't harm the tree and we do it each nine years until the tree has 
between 200 and 250 years. So we are by far the world leader in cork processing. We are completely vertically integrated, let's say from the forest to the, to the bottle and, and to the flooring, depending on the application. Our really uh, vision and mission is uh, valuing cork. And uh, uh, as you will also see, and this is very important because in each product that we uh, develop, we have a concept of eco-design. So for us, the uh, carbon footprint and, and, cork, uh, uh, and, and the carbon balance is always an attribute for, for, for the product. Just for you to have an idea, I'm not talking about uh, the, the, the cork as a raw material, per each ton of cork that we extract from the cork oak tree, uh, the forest retains about uh, 73 uh, tons of uh, CO2. And if we compare the emissions if of our overall processes and industry, it's about 4% of all the CO2 that is retained in the, in, in the forest. So really impressive uh, figures in terms of environment. As I told you, we are vertically integrated. So we have Amarin Forest. So we start, as you know, cork oak uh, uh, tree is based mainly in the Mediterranean basin. Uh, and we have a, a, a division that takes care of uh, uh, all the forest and then we have for other divisions that basically dedicate themselves to the development of new materials and, and, and products in different uh, uh, set of segments. First, we have, of course, the stoppers. Okay, last year we did 5 billion uh, stoppers, basically three segments, the reds and wines, the sparkling wine, and also then the, the more the, the digestives. Then we have uh, the flooring division, the flooring division, uh, production in Portugal, and then uh, 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 several sales companies all around the world. Number one market is by far uh, 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 Germany. Then we have the cork insulation, and in cork insulation, uh, we develop a natural material basically dedicated to uh, what we call the sustainable uh, construction. And last but not least, cork composite material. And in this division, what we do, uh, let's say the starting point is always cork. The, the main goal is to develop the new cork of the world. So a new set of other applications, uh, 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 other, uh, uh, other products for other segments. And this would be, let's say, a conglomerate of new applications that will probably in the future give birth to, to, to new divisions, okay? It's, it's, it's like an aquarium of a new, uh, uh, um, it's like an aquarium of uh, 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 new applications. So we did last year, it was not a very good year, but we did 150 years uh, during the pandemic. We had a lot of celebrations going on that we had to cancel, unfortunately. Uh, we are uh, present in uh, 28 com countries, okay, physically with factories, with sales uh, companies, and we have more than 1,200 people outside Portugal. We do business in more than 100 countries. By far, Portugal, it's 5%, it's, 6% it's, it's of our uh, 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 turnover. And uh, we have, uh, and we base a lot of our growth on innovation, as you will see in the, throughout the presentation. Now, coming back to core, because it's very important to, impor to, to, to understand what is this raw material about, to then correlate to which type of applications we develop. So, basically, there are three drivers of value for Cork. First one, it's a natural, recyclable, sustainable material with a very high performance in what concerns environment. Second, it's everything that has to do with the sensorial part of, of cork, with the visual, with the warm touch, with the smell. So everything, everything that appeals, let's say, to, to, to the senses. And uh, third, and probably for us the most important one, are, let's say, the functional properties of cork. Okay, and functional properties of cork, they come uh, basically from two things. One, 
from the cellular cellular structure of of, of cork and, and 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 second from the chemical composition. And this is why at the end that cork is a very very light uh, material. It's like a, a, a air carrier. It's very resilient. It's compressible. You can compress, for example, a cork stopper, but it has elastic memory. It, it means that it will recover the initial shape very, very fast. Uh, it's very effective uh, to insulate, uh, whether it is acoustic or thermal. It's very resistant. It, 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 it is resistant also to very high temperatures. And, uh, and, uh, and this is, let's say, the basis of, the, of product development uh, for us. We are aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals on, the, on all the three uh, pillars. And we use internally uh, uh, the concept of zero waste, okay? So we use 100% of the cork that uh, we harvest, 100, okay? The, the, the application that uh, values less cork is the production of thermal energy that we use as a biomass. But then we have, as we will see, several other applications, but there are a lot of different types of cork depending on density from 300 kilos per cubic meter to uh, uh, around 40 kilos per cubic meter and we have usage uh, for it all, okay? We also, we go a little bit beyond that because we have huge programs to collect uh, post-consumer uh, stoppers, okay? Um, we also recover more than 90% of all the industrial waste uh, that we generate and we do it internally. 66% of our energy is biomass and even the electrical one. Now we are setting up a program uh, to produce our own electrical energy from solar as Angelo was referring and also from other sources. And, and, and so a very high percentage of what we use in the production of our products is renewable, is recyclable, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and uh, we take care a lot about the carbon footprint and carbon balance of each material that we develop, okay? So we have, as, as one of the pillars is innovation. All the business units, they have their own departments of, of, of innovation because the needs, the roadmap, the strategic uh, 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 objectives, they are, of course, different. So uh, uh, um, each one of the business units has to have capabilities to support the execution of the strategy. And in terms of innovation, our annual budget is around six, seven, eight million euros per year. So then we can start and see some of the applications and the applications basically they are the result of the combination between cork and other materials. We are going to see composite materials. It's not 100% cork, but cork is really the differentiator element for each one of these applications. Here, for example, I'm talking about mobility. Uh, we, uh, we develop materials and we are looking deeply in, in mobility at the moment uh, for interiors and also for structural parts. Here you can see an example with Siemens, okay? It's in the flooring, it's in the flooring of, 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 of the train. We do metros, uh, core, core materials for metro, core materials for trains, also for trucks, lorries, also cars. We are looking after that. But at the moment, uh, we are mainly in, uh, in, 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 in the rail and also in the metro. And we did uh, a, a lot of projects with uh, uh, Bombardier, with, uh, with, with Siemens, uh, in Europe and out of Europe, mainly in Asia. Here you have another example. We also develop materials mainly for the mega yacht, okay? Non-slippery properties of work, very important very durable the materials also, uh, the warm touch and also the uh, thermal insulation in this type of application it's uh, quite uh, quite uh, quite important and of course complying with all the certifications for this type of uh, material. Here in construction this is a more uh, uh, technical application and in construction we develop materials for example for the base build insulation 
it means that we develop materials that are used in the foundations of the building to insulate completely the building from all the vibrations that come, for example, from a train station or from a metro. So we develop all the materials that are used uh, for, for, for the foundations. And uh, we also uh, uh, develop materials for the acoustics. It means for the interior of the building to insulate, for example, we have a five-star hotel to insulate the gym floor or, or a swimming pool or even a disco from uh, the floors where the, the people are probably having uh, some rest. And here we have some partners like uh, CDM, uh, one of the main players in this uh, uh, very technical application in the world, and also in rail. Okay? In rail, what we do is to we produce materials for the infrastructure, and we are the exclusive uh, suppliers of uh, Pandrol, which is one of the largest companies in the world. So as the train starts to approach the train station, we have to take care of the vibrations to reduce, let's say, all the vibrations and we develop materials precisely for this type of application. Now, footwear. Uh, in the footwear, probably, you see mostly, let's say, for, for the cork in fashion, like in uh, La Boutin, Gucci, so Dior, okay? But uh, the way that we are moving forward is a little bit more technical. Uh, our main customer here in this application is Birkenstock, okay? Uh, probably you know them, uh, the German uh, brand. At the moment, uh, we are also uh, working with, uh, with, we have two very important projects, one with Nike and the other one with, with Adidas. We are using also in this sector the, 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 the concept of circular economy uh, to other industries. It means that we are collecting also at the moment, and we have signed a protocol with, with, with Nike, and we are uh, uh, at the moment collecting all the waste that they generate uh, in the factories in Asia. And with the waste, we are developing new materials. In this case, the first materials that we are about to launch, uh, we will launch in July. It's a co-branded product, Nike Amorim, and we will uh, uh, launch it in the United States in Home Depot. Then flooring, flooring uh, in flooring, it's the se second largest application for cork in the world. And here we develop finished flooring, also components for flooring producers, whether it is an underlay, whether it is a core material, or, 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 or a top layer, uh, uh, or accessories. We also sell accessories, what is called uh, uh, underlayments, okay? It's, a, it, it's an underlayment that you put between the, the concrete and the flooring to make sure that you have more comfort, you have uh, the sound insulation, also thermal protection, uh, the biodynamics, etc., etc., etc. We are also in the aerospace uh, for quite a long time. We supply, uh, uh, if you see, let's say, the nose of the shuttle, we, we, we develop materials that, for the thermal shield, okay? Usually they paint it in, uh, 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 as you see, in a white color, but it's made of cork. We, here we are competing with uh, ceramics, with carbons, uh, and we supply for NASA, European Spatial Agency, for SpaceX, uh, Boeing, uh, for um, uh, Lockheed Martin. So we are with all the major uh, people that are, and, and aerospace as uh, mobility and also as energy in a huge, huge change. It's a huge change and we are also developing new materials here in this, in this, in this sector. Another sector is power industry. In power industry, basically, we work also with the major brands, uh, ABB, Siemens, and we do two applications. One, we do the sealing, okay, to seal uh, the synthetic oils that are running inside the, 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 the energy transformer. Uh, synthetic oils uh, at the very high temperatures, sometimes very aggressive, and we have to make sure that they maintain the performance over time for some decades. Uh, one of the characteristics of the materials is the behavior of cork uh, with very 
low temperatures uh, outside and very high temperatures inside. So we can go even to the to, near to the North Pole, uh, and in some cases like Russia, the, as they are uh, conquering the North Pole, they also uh, need to 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 put energy in the in the satellites that they are moving that that they are settling to the north. And also uh, another application here in the power industry is the vibration control. So. Uh, uh, whether it is in the cities or in the in the in the big uh, uh, industrial facilities, it's important also to control all the vibration uh, uh, of the transformers. Then, uh, uh, one uh, we we have here we have a completely different application. Okay, um, we have started this application. I would say five years ago, we have launched. Two years ago, a joint ventures just dedicated to sport surfaces, and we do two applications in this segment. We do, let's say, the infill, okay, that is in direct contact with people, competing directly with EPDMs and rubbers. Uh, it's way more efficient in terms of temperature. You don't have all the negative emissions that come from uh, uh, from from rubber. Uh, you don't need to irrigate uh, the, the the field before uh, just uh, before you you, you play uh, uh, because with 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 uh, with recycled rubber uh, it, it gets really really hot and also in terms of environmental emissions it's it's way better and also the biodynamics the biodynamics in the, in the, we started in the United States and they did some studies where they proved that with cork they were getting less injuries than with the, 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 the usual materials and they were able even to reduce some uh, insurance uh, costs that they were having. We also developed uh, uh, the layer that is below the artificial uh, turf which is called the shock pad. Okay, so but we, here we have uh, uh, just a team dedicated to, to develop this application. And this one, we, we, we launched last year, okay? We launched this new application last year. Basically here, we developed a system uh, based on Cork for the playgrounds for the kids. So we started in South Korea, then uh, we went to, to, to Stockholm uh, as uh, they were uh, the European city of the for the environment, something like uh, like that, and we also settled this year, uh, uh, the last year, a joint venture just dedicated to uh, develop this new application and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, in terms of drainage of water, uh, this 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 system is 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 very 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 uh, is it has a fantastic performance, also. It has what they call the headfall, okay? Because we have to comply with several certifications, and we comply with the high, with the most demanding certifications for the high fall. It, it means the impact for the kids. If they fell down, uh, we have to uh, make sure that they don't uh, get hurt. Also, the emissions. Also, for example, in the summer, they can play, uh, and and it will not get hot. So. Uh, there is uh, no problem even in the summer to, 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 to play with this type of uh, solution that we are uh, developing. Here uh, uh, you can see is the iCorp factory, innovation factory. So all these new applications and solutions that you see here, they are developed here in the iCorp factory. So we have a factory where we are bringing all the new technologies, all the new materials, also a lot of knowledge uh, from the applications and the new segments. And this is our lab, okay, lab, lab, but, but also it's a factory. We have a lot of machinery here where we do the trials and before we escalate it to the operations, we can try uh, a lot in the real time. Of course, that for this, it's very important, the academia. We have several, here we have uh, some of the partnerships that we have internally here in, in, in Portugal. We also have mainly in the United States and very important in Germany. Those are the three most important uh, pillars for academia that we have, Portugal, Germany and the United States. 
We have several projects for very different applications and segments also uh, going on. And last but not the least, and because not all, all the ideas come from the internal, we also have a venture capital to finance ideas of people that are willing to develop new materials, new solutions that involve pork. Uh, we have an internal shark tank uh, they are invited to, to do a very short uh, presentation and then we have, uh, let's say, all the, the if, if they get, let's say, and they are able to pass in all the gates, then uh, besides being partners and invest and co-invest with them, we also help them and support to do the business plan, to develop the new materials, to test and so on. So it's a venture capital just dedicated to capture ideas to develop novel applications for pork. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, João Pedro. Thank you. Professor Fátima Carvalho, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good afternoon. I'm a teacher in Polytechnic Institute of Beja. My, my research area is water technologies and is for that that we uh, he observed some problems in our region uh, related to agri-food processes like wine uh, production, uh, olive oil production, slaughterhouse, wastewater uh, factories and uh, cheese factories. So today I want to show you how you solve some problems associated to these agri-food processes. So. Um, I think all of you know that when you buy a liter of olive oil, it means that uh, to produce this olive oil uh, liter, there was produced one liter of olive meal wastewater. So the same at the same time, when we buy a bottle of wine, it means that four liters of winery wastewater was produced. And uh, sorry, uh, the olive uh, wastewater is uh, is a purple, ever purple color, high turbidity, existence uh, of suspended soils. It smells of wine. So the olive oil uh, wastewater uh, is homogeneous wastewater. It's have a dark brown color, high turbidity and strong odor. When we buy a kilogram of meat, it means that 80 liters of slaughterhouse wastewater was produced. This wastewater is easily produced, possible, is, uh, smell is very strong, have a high turbidity like fat in suspension, air, meat, sand, and digested food, and have a reddish color due to the existence of blood. And finally, uh, only I will show you four examples of my uh, technology development. So when we eat cheese or when you buy a kilogram of cheese, it means that 50 liters of cheese by wastewater was produced during the cheese producing process. So this wastewater uh, presents opaque yellow, yellowish color turbidity uh, due to suspend fat when stored and a strong, very strong smell. Of course, this wastewater uh, 
in terms of kind of physical kind of characteristics, it's a biggest problem for the companies, for the agri-food um, factories, because uh, in our region and of course in the world, many of uh, uh, most of them is. Uh, a small industries they haven't uh, technology they haven't no money to to have a specialized technology or to buy a specialized technology because it's the costs is very high so the problems could be uh, in resume the treatments the existing treatments have very high associated costs they require very specialized labor do not suit the seasonality of the activity. All of these activities are, uh, uh, only appears in a part of the year and uh, the existing technologies don't uh, reach the dis discharge standards. So, uh, we try to help these uh, factories. Of course, when we uh, help these factories, we help all factories of the world because our technology is uh, is published in uh, in uh, articles and uh, in uh, form of patents. So we try to to show for these problems and to to see some opportunities because these wastewater have these problems, but at the same time it have. Uh, nutrients you have some some other um, valuable substances that could be used to help these uh, these small uh, these small factories or of course the big factories to obtain valuable products with this wastewater so we we try to develop unconventional treatments that is too easy to apply and with the low associated costs. However, you try to, to do another thing. You try to, to use a reactant that is in, at same times um, a nutrient for plants and have the capacity to react spontaneously with atmospheric CO2. So our technology is a patented technology, our first technology patented, and is, uh, um, is developed with Shizue wastewater. So you use only one reactant that is a nutrient that is now used uh, for soil correction and, as I told, reacts spontaneously with atmospheric CO2 and can contribute to uh, to the decreasing the green gases uh, and our technology when was applied to Shizue was to water could change the state of the art of this uh, problem Shizue was water until our technology all the technologies need some pretreatments dilution fat removal the anaerobic biodegradation don't uh, um, don't work well because the fats it's a problem because the seasonality and uh, with our technology we can change the state of the art you can offer to the mainly to the small factories uh, and one technology that could be used for them because it's uh, it is uh, uh, cheap and could uh, be used for someone that haven't a specialized uh, skills. So uh, our technology uh, was upgraded and you we uh, develop another technology that could be coupled to the, the first technology and to achieve the um, the rules to um, that could um, discharge the treated wastewater in the rivers, or at the same time, they could could be used as agriculture use because you maintain some uh, nutrients in the water. We remove all the suspended soils uh, solids 
all the fats and the water could be used uh, in agriculture purposes. At the same time, if the te our pretreatment, our technology patented is used for uh, biggest uh, factories, for cheese factories, they could uh, allow the, uh, the traditional technologies like aerobic biodegradation. We did this technology, we, uh, we prepared some nutritive solutions and we can you crop the uh, tomato with this treated wastewater as a nutritive solution and the tomato have, uh, the tomato presented increased um, properties, nutritional properties like uh, antioxidants. This pro and uh, at the same time, the lettuce is present also increased her, um, her uh, properties as a lettuce. Um, nutritional properties. So, with this uh, technology, with the application of our nutritive solution uh, that was prepared uh, after our patented technology, we achieved two national awards uh, of the Green Project Awards and the Vida Rural in 2015 and 2013. Our technologies, like I say, is is published and after this success of the technology we continue to to try to improve the the capacity of treated water with our technology and we we make a, a, a revision in a, in a, in a book uh, that we study the potentialities of, of the waters to be a nutritive solution for hydroponic systems. And because this hydroponic system could, could uh, be part of the smart city, cities, for example, or cities of the future. And uh, with our technology, we could achieve the biggest project uh, named Hydroviews that was um, financed for trying to develop um, a connection between water and food. So we, we used the, the first technology to produce a nutritive solution and with nutritive solution I can crop in a hydroponic system tomato plants. This, uh, this project um, was a success. Is uh, it ended at the final of December 2020, and we try we, we develop another technology, another uh, about process process for production of lettuce by hydroponics using treated wastewater. Because this uh, this project uh, was applied to tomato and also to lettuce crop. In um, our, our um, patent, our technology produces also nutritive solutions, but organomineral fertilizers. And these organomineral fertilizers was used as a soil amendment. We use it in uh, amendment of uh, acid soil with a pH uh, 5.331. And you need 12 and 50 um, uh, grams of this organ mineral fertilizer to correct the pH of the soil to seven to, neut to the neutrality and to crop a special plant like is red pectin. The results show us that the organ mineral fertilizers is a very good organ mineral fertilizer that could correct the soil and be able to produce uh, plants. And now uh, we are involved in another project named NETA, New Strategies in Wastewater Treatment. It's a project in co-promotion with companies and it's the biggest project that went to study the potentialities of our uh, treated uh, water uh, in uh, 
uh, aquaponic valorization. So we will try to produce, to treat agroindustrial wastewater with our technology and this wastewater be able or are uh, able to uh, aquaponic systems and to, to produce fish and at some times to produce plants. So the byproducts of this, um, this technology will be will be uh, be a with with be submission submitted to bioconversion by soldier fly larvae this technology is another technology associated to our, uh, our technology and to produce agronomic fertilizers and larvae for production of chitin and oil and also for feed for fish so it's important to have a technology, a technology with potential, and this potential can be um, can be used to to jump to another technology and to produce more and more uh, technologies, more and more products. So we are very happy to to have take this technology and to can uh, contribute to a green to a green planet to to transform a biggest problem that is uh, wastewater from agro industries in something that the producers could have value add um, value add um, value, value add um, Money, so you, they they have not a problem. They can uh, they can look for this wastewater and think that it's some raw materials for something like uh, for other things. So they we can help this uh, this agro industry to achieve economy circular economy at same times with each uh, liter of water treated we can we can capture an half and gram uh, CO2 capture with uh, our technology. So uh, I think uh, we can, it's a, a biggest contribute for uh, a green planet, so a sustainable planet in this area of research. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Fatima and João Pedro, for your insightful lectures. We are absolutely sure that innovation is the key word. And uh, sorry, I'm going to do a little break. Two, okay. Yes. And to reflect on the future of the organization of the world cities making them clear and quieter, let's listen to Mr. João Tromoceiro from the Municipality of Lisbon, who will speak about the concept of smart cities and the strategy that must be adopted. Thank you. Mr. Thank João, you the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> I hope my sound is working properly because I had problems with uh, the sound. Um, we we discuss already some different type of resources here, and I I will talk about another resource that is very important for the cities. That is data. So um, let me start um, explain what is uh, Lisbon right now. Lisbon is a is not a large city in the Europe, but we have all roughly the same type of problems that another cities and capital cities in the Europe they have. So uh, we have half a million of population, but every day entering the city, the same amount of people um, entering the city also almost uh, uh, 400,000 uh, cars, and we have a pressure of the, um, the tourism. And this all this pressure is in specific uh, points of the city. So it's not in all the city, but it's specific points of the city. So the, uh, this is create problems and creates uh, and that are very challenging for, for the manager of the city. And what are the expectations of the citizen? And the citizen expects that uh, they can have services, uh, better services and more services everywhere in the, in the, 
in every place, uh, available anywhere, anytime, and any device. And that uh, is a very big challenge for some for a city like uh, Lisbon with the old structure, um, old habits also. And that is a great challenge for, for the manager of the city. And at the same time, the managers of the, they, they need to be quick. They need to decide. They need to be more efficient. They need to be more proactive. And they need to be attentive, attentive to the citizen needs. And how we can do that? We can do that with data. Data can help us. It's not the only tool, but data can help us. If we have data, uh, we can decide better and create a, a, a data-driven organization. We can be more efficient in the use of our resources. Um, um, we can be more proactive because, because if we have data about the past, if we know how uh, things work, we can predict the future, and if we and uh, if we can predict the future, we can take actions to avoid the impact uh, of the problems or avoid uh, the problems. And uh, and with data, also we can uh, be more attentive to the needs of the citizen needs that are changing um, very quickly. So, for a traditional organization like the City of Lisbon. These are big challenges for organization um, like us. So because of this, uh, we consider that data are a resource very important for us. So we need to work and, and create value with our data and also acquire more data and have more data to take better decisions. So we think uh, data can promote innovation better services to the citizen, uh, help us to be more efficient, proactive, and transparent in the management of the, of the city. And this is, our, this is our main goal with the using of data in the city. And because of that, uh, some uh, five years ago, we launched an uh, initiative that uh, was uh, have um, what we call the Lisbon Intelligent Management Platform. And that is a key uh, piece of uh, software that can help us to manage data in the city. So what we have here is a platform that integrates different sources of data, data from partners of the municipality, data from the internal services of the municipality, and data from IoT, uh, from different kinds of sensors. So we have data in the platform from occurrences, for example, occurrence for the fire department, for the police, uh, civil protection services. We have data from ways, from the traffic, from the bicycles sharing systems and the giras, data from the, the waste containers. We have more than 2000 containers with sensors and we know uh, how, the, how these containers are full or empty and when, when they uh, are collected and so on. And we have, for example, uh, data from the noise on all the bars of the city. For 10 and 10 minutes, we receive uh, uh, data uh, information about the noise in the bars and um, that have uh, live music in the city of Lisbon. This normally is a problem right now. Unfortunately, it's not a problem in the city of Lisbon because, because all the bars are closed. Um, but this is a big problem in the, in the city of Lisbon. We have environmental data, pollution data. We have information about the parking spaces, cameras, uh, um, charging points uh, for the electric cars. And so we have more than 200 layers of data. But the important here is to have data in this platform, uh, data that is collected in real time, data that can help us to act very quickly and also to learn about the past to predict the future and to take better decisions in the future. And this uh, platform uh, is very important for us to help us to do that. So we have this platform, this platform deliver information to an integrated operation center where the city is managed in real time, 24 hours a day, where, where we have the police, the fire department, civil protection service, mobility services, and so on. We have the information that is delivered to the citizens. Uh, we have a hub. Uh, with Wolf 24, where the citizen can 
specific information. We deliver information to the municipal services. This platform integrate data and share data and also share data uh, with the smart city projects. So all the projects that we have of smart cities, they work with this platform and this platform deliver also data to the, our open data portal that is very important for create innovation. So if we have all this, da all this data, uh, it's key for us to create value with this data and for an organization like a, a public organization like, like uh, the Municipality of Lisbon, it's very difficult to have data scientists and data engineers in the municipality because, because we can, it's not possible to pay um, the wages that uh, these uh, people have. So we create an initiative that is the Lisbon, Lisbon Urban Data Lab. The, these initiatives where, where we have different partners of the, of the, of the academy uh, that we, uh, with, uh, with them, we sign a protocol and we have the rules to the use of the data and rules to create value with the data. What we do is we have challenge that the services of the municipality want uh, need to solve. Challenge about, uh, for example, optimization of the solid waste collection, uh, optimization of the, um, of the balancing of the bi bicycles and the sharing system, um, detecting problems in the pavement uh, uh, with the, the image of the mobile phone or predicting the traffic or detecting problems in the signposting or um, predicting, for example, where, when will, will happen occurrences, uh, where uh, will happen occurrences in the near future, for example, when we have a big event. So we have different kinds of problems <coughs> that, we call, where, that we launch to these universities and these partners, um, and they can solve the problems. Um, we have the right to use the algorithmics and the, the, the knowledge that the university has created, but the university can use these algorithmics and create, a, a publish and create a startups, a uh, create solutions for the market. That is always possible, but uh, is a way that create uh, for creating innovation with data. Um, and to solve the difficulty of the public of the public organization, but like the municipality of Lisbon, that uh, we don't have means to to have um, uh, human resources uh, specific for this kind of task. So right now we have uh, uh, thirteen active uh, challenges where we have more than twenty six. Uh, we have thirty six uh, teams working in these challenges. Uh, teams from different uh, universities um, and that is very useful for us and is also useful for them because they are, have um, access to real data from the from a city. At the same time, like I said, uh, we have an open data portal that is very important for creating innovation because these are data that uh, we are uh, right now in this in our portal we have more than the um, 300 sets of data, data that uh, some of them are in real time and data that uh, can be used by uh, uh, companies, by startups, universities and so on in the free, in the totally free way to create what they want. We, they don't need to, to talk with the city uh, to do what they want with this, uh, this data. And with this, uh, uh, like uh, every city in the world, we are we have uh, uh, different kinds of initiatives for that. We right now we can call smart uh, city projects, uh, uh, projects in the environment or with the city service for the cities and management, uh, and mobility, and so on. Different kinds of projects. I will talk specific about. Uh, two projects that we are launching right now that we think that are uh, very important. One of them is to, uh, we are deploying a network of uh, stations in the city, uh, roughly eight, eight, uh, 18, uh, 80, 80 uh, stations in the city where we collect data about noise, weather data, pollution data, and also traffic data. 
and we will receive this data in real time. And this is very important for us to know how the city works. And uh, uh, and this uh, is the, the type of data that we can use with, uh, with for example, uh, data from the other sensors that we have um, to create the knowledge to predict the future in the in the more precise way to act uh, and to use to be more efficient to be more proactive like I said in the beginning. Um, another initiative that is very important for us is our LoRa network. We are deploying this LoRa network in all the city. Um, and it is an open uh, network, a uh, network that is, can be used by the, the municipality, but also can be used by startups, universities, uh, private citizens. Um, we don't have limits. Um, it's totally free. Um, what we want here is to create innovation because this type of network, LoRa network, is a uh, works with the low power. Uh, um, and very cheap and very easy to, to install sensors. And uh, the main goal here is to promote the creation of data and to promote uh, this uh, innovation in all the sectors in the, um, the city. So this is a, is a network that will uh, be uh, deployed this year. We are already working in the field. So um, and it's a very important initiative to have uh, more uh, a more diverse ecosystems of the device in the in the city that can bring data and can be used to create um, a more in, uh, more insights about uh, the, uh, how the city works. So this is a brief presentation of our projects. This uh, is all. Thank you. Thank you, João, for your interesting contribution to the debate for a better world and also for a smart and sustainable cities. Thanks. We are now at the end of this relevant webinar. And I would like to thank our speakers on behalf of INPI for all your insightful speeches, which give us hope in a brighter future, leaving a better legacy for generations to come. For the closing session, I would like to welcome Mrs. Margarida Matias, board member of the Portuguese Institute of Industrial Property, Margarida, the floor is yours. Thank you, João. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine that you are a caveman from 40,000 years ago. You have mastered fire, built simple tools for hunting, learned to make clothes from animal skins to keep warm in wintertime. What would you choose? to invent next. It seems absurd that you would invent, for example, a flute, when there is still so many immediate needs to require a solution. Creating and inventing out of a human need seems to be surprisingly common in the history of innovation. The individual invents and creates things because he wants to survive feed these children or conquer the neighboring village. In today's world, one longs to understand how innovating can help with one of the biggest problems that humanity faces, global warming. In fact, human beings tend to be too optimistic about the future and believe that the problem will somehow be solved, even though they are completely unaware how, of how. Moreover, the inertia of humanity is essentially because individuals tend to neglect issues of high magnitude as they feel powerless. People are more likely to act when the issue can be clearly identified. As we take nature for granted, we don't always pay the attention it deserves. 
until recently, we were not aware of how much a global catastrophe, such as the pandemic, could affect all of our lives. All the speakers that we heard this afternoon share such a pioneering spirit. We have seen that the combination of ideas and technologies can produce great advantage by doing more with less. Advantage that can help us to achieve a desirable balance between technologies and nature. Several international organizations, such as the World Intellectual Property Organization and the European Patent Office that you heard today, are very concerned about building a more promising and sustainable future for the next generations. They endeavor to create mechanisms that incite civil society to better understand sustainability calling on inventors and creators to develop practical solutions. About the future, there is an essential aspect, well, that is necessary, but not enough on its own, which is to do no harm. We have to make our daily lives more efficient using less energy and more recycled or degradable material. It is therefore urgent to create solutions that allow us and above all, the next generations, not only to survive, but to flourish. That said, we need to use nature's everlasting energy, solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, in a more sustainable way. Every year, government incentives, changes in public policies, and technological advance make these clean, renewable energy sources more appealing to business and to citizens. Moving from fossil fuels to a diverse set of renewable energy sources, such as solar, waves, and other form of clean energy production is a step in the right direction that is taken by means of our imagination, because the most renewable energy we have is our own potential and our own passion to innovate towards a better world. We need to rethink the way we move every day. We need to prevent bigger problems by creating the transportation of the future, which requires necessary and urgent adjustments to our lifestyle. At this point, we can say that at the end of this webinar, we will be living enlightened and looking forward to walking towards the future. In order to change this paradigm, the human mind has created new designs that help transforming the tools we use to spend energy on, such as heating, cooling, among others, into new solutions that allow us to use less energy. We already illuminate our buildings with daylight, cool them with breezes, and heat them with the sun. When we use all of these, we find that in some cases, the energy used in a building can be reduced around 90%. Well, if you have 8 billion people living on a planet whose cities also steal the future, we will quickly run out of future. However, if we think differently, we can have cities that produce fewer emissions, but also that provide unlimited possibilities for their inhabitants. It has been increasingly a knowledge that technology is part of the solution in the fight against climate change. Innovation has a key role to play in fighting climate change. If we look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we conclude that more than half require the creation and continued existence over time of technological solutions. Well, besides being an exciting conclusion, it makes us realize the urgency of developing and using green technologies, because only then it is possible to have a sustainable social, political, economic, and environmental development. There is no doubt that making the transition to a low carbon future is a complex and multifaceted task. Nevertheless, we humans have the collective wisdom, ingenuity, and creativity to imagine new 
and more effective ways of building a green future. And IP plays a, decis a decisive role in this journey. Thus, intellectual property acts as a strategy which allies innovation to this various sector of activity by temporarily conferring exclusive rights. Patents enable companies to capture the value of their inventions and consequently concede investment in their improvement. The imperative proliferation of these inventions, which incidentally has been welcomed in the political agendas at European level, owes much to the small and medium-sized enterprises and their internationalization enhanced by the opportunities of the global market. This path that SMEs take, starting with an idea and growing into a product, includes obstacles which can be managed and overcome with the help of intellectual property. That is why the World Intellectual Property Day, which we are celebrating today, is dedicated this year to SMEs. In this way, we are celebrating the importance they have in the recovery of the EU economy and in the development and commercialization of successful sustainable solutions through the protection and the exploitation of IP rights and its integration in their business strategy. However, the diffusion of green technologies is lower than expected which is why additional incentives are necessary by means of public policies that promote, among others, design financing, business partnerships, and the protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights. In order that in conversations with children about global warming, we are confronted with the answer, your generation created this problem and you are the ones who have to solve it, let us all agree and recover this planet that is only one and that is the industrial property of all of us. It is also important not to forget that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Thank you so much, Margarida, for your words. And with this very interesting and hopeful, hopeful intervention, the webinar about the future of planet Earth as the industrial property of all of us reaches to its end. Thank you very much for your assistance, hoping that this important issue will be a priority in all EU member states and all over the world. One last important information, please don't forget that in the main stage of this platform, the high-level conference on e-justice continues today and tomorrow. It is a very important opportunity to reflect on the process of transition to digital justice on the opportunities that emerge and the different challenges that arise and to guarantee the access of all citizens to justice, effective systems and the more modern justice in the 21st century. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Bye.